Hey everybody, it's Monday, April 22nd, and uh, welcome to Clo Pepe and Clo Pepe Vineyards. Oliver says hello as well. And today we're going to take a week off from questions and answers, and I'm going to teach you guys a little bit about Pinot Noir, how to taste Pinot Noir, and basically everything I know about Pinot Noir in 10 minutes or less. Uh, we've got three Pinot Noirs in front of me. I've got the 2011 Pinot Noir from Clo Pepe, and while I have it up, I'll put a little in a glass. I have the 2010 Clo Pepe Pinot Noir. And I have the 2009 Clo Pepe Pinot Noir. So we're going to talk a little bit about Pinot Noir style. We're going to talk a little bit about Pinot Noir ripeness. We're going to talk about Pinot Noir structure. And I'm going to tell you about how I taste Pinot Noir and what I look for in a quality Pinot Noir. So we're starting with the, uh, the youngest Pinot Noir. So we're talking about style. Style in young Pinot Noir, I expect it to be fruity. I expect it to be bright. But I expect the style also to show enough elegance and earth and enough uh, complexity that doesn't make the wine monolithic. So the 2011 was a wonderful, long, cool growing season with a little heat spike all right, in September and October. So it's a very classic Pinot Noir vintage. Aromas are very earthy, cherry, a little bit of vanilla, a little bit of earth, a little bit of dust, slight bits of maybe sort of almost like a, a, a minerality, or, um, but it's fresh, it's bright, and it's primary. So when I say primary, I mean the wine has a lot of fruit. So the 2011 stylistically is very balanced. I think the 11s throughout this valley are going to age extraordinarily well. And later we're going to talk a little bit about the difference between acid and uh, tannin in Pinot Noir because Pinot Noir is one of those rare red wines that's actually structured as much by acid as it is by tannin. So as I taste and evaluate this stylistically, the wine is a little bit light in the mouth. It's ephemeral. It's not heavy like a Cabernet or a Syrah. It's not a Pinot Noir pretending to be anything. It has beautiful elegance. I think it's light enough that it could match with salmon. It's still very primary, still very fruity. A wine that's this young and this delicate, it's not delicate, but it's nice kind of mid-body, mid-palate. It's sort of like making a great Pinot Noir is like writing a novel. Uh, when you first make a Pinot Noir, it's like the first draft of your novel. It's got a beginning, a middle, and an end, but the three parts of the novel, the three parts of the wine, aren't talking to each other. But imagine if you could write the first draft of a novel, put it in a drawer someplace, and open it up five years later, and magically, all of the disparate elements begin to talk to each other. And that's what happens in Pinot Noir. So when we make a delicate, elegant Pinot Noir, specifically in a style that we love to make, like the 2011, all the parts are there, but they're not talking to each other. There's no integration. So the integration requires that the tannins start uh, taking it from its uh, sort of a molecular form into a polymer form of tannins, which will lay across the tongue, be a little bit more velvetine than, than perky. So the wine is very young, very perky, slightly, I wouldn't say acidic, but it has a lot of verve. And that verve is going to allow the wine to uh, mature and age extremely slowly and extremely nicely. As opposed to the 2010 Clo Pepe Pinot Noir, which is very rich, and very ripe. I've, I've been kind of uh, calling this wine a little bit slutty. It's a little bit of a pole dancer of a Pinot. It's rich, it's, it's ripe, it offers tons of fruit, it's very come hither, it's very sexy and willing, has very round edges, less acidity, more tannin, more richness, and uh, I think it kind of needs a ribeye or a steak or, or some lamb. It, it requires a little bit more. So stylistically, this is the riper style. Style that you would see a little bit more in a Loring Wine Company wine or maybe some of the wines, uh, the bigger wines from Sea Smoke. So the 2010 is nice because even in one label with three different vintages, we have three totally different styles of wine. 2011, elegant. 2010, very bold and ripe. 2009, starting to show a little bit of age. So as we taste the 2010, as a big burst of fruit on the attack. And the attack is what happens with the wine when it first hits my palate. So as I taste it, it's very rich and ripe. It's very easy to understand without food. 2011, I really wanted, um, you know, something like maybe some duck. 2010, I really want a steak because it really needs some fat to match the impact of that flavor. So stylistically and with ripeness, the 2010 has been exacerbated as far as the richness and the ripeness it's, it's rounder, it's richer, it's softer, and it's more approachable. So if I'm drinking wine as a cocktail, I'm going to go to something rich and ripe like that 2010 style, high 14s, low 15% alcohol, as opposed to the mid 13% on the other two wines on the table. So 2010, unapologetic, you know, California, all about sunshine, richness, ripeness. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's a wine that's just like your perfect first date, rich, ripe, and willing. Maybe I've talked too much about myself. 2009, we've got the 2009 Pinot Noir, and this is a wine that's gonna be, uh, has uh, three and a half ages, uh, three and a half years of bottle age. 
So the wine's going to have a really, really nice, elegant, and, st and the beginning of a wine that's starting to show some, some earthiness, a little bit of complexity. So wine like people, if it's really young and really beautiful, it doesn't really have to develop much of a, a, a personality, complexity, or character. Uh, but as a wine ages and loses a little bit of its fruit, it does really compensate by developing character. And uh, that's why I think I love to drink old wines. Old wines are divorced from all that affectation of fruit. Complexity exists in Pinot Noir when it's young and fruity and we can't taste it. It's kind of like baby fat on the cheeks. You can't really imagine the adult face until it loses its baby fat. And the 09 has began to lose its baby fat, so instead of tasting big, bright, rich, ripe, dark berry fruits, I'm starting to smell a little bit more cherry, dried cherry, uh, a little bit more violet rose petals, the emergence of something that will originally be a little bit leathery when the wine reaches its full maturity. So as it loses its baby fat, it's really starting to show some, some really pretty notes that existed when the wine was young, but it was covered up by all that fruit. So is fruit the enemy of great Pinot Noir, or does fruit dictate the quality of a Pinot Noir? I think it's the, it's, it's the previous. I think that too much fruit in a Pinot Noir takes you away from the place and the time where it was grown. And when a wine becomes fully sublimated and the fruit sort of dies down and the complexity emerges, that's when those are the wines that really drive me crazy and really get me thinking about, wow, this wine was farmed beautifully, it was made beautifully, and then we were patient enough to allow the wine to become mature. Uh, so, you know, drinking the 2010s, like dating an 18-year-old, they're going to look great naked, but they're going to suck as far as conversation at table, while the 09 is much more like dating someone who has enough maturity and education, not only to keep you um, uh, fascinated by its beauty at the table, but also by the conversation and, and the depth of the complexity that this can bring to a, a, a table experience. So that's sort of a quick and dirty summation of the 2011, 2009, 2010 Pinot Noirs, and then... Um, what I was going to teach you about, one thing about that's amazing about Pinot Noir and why it's so difficult for some people to understand it is because most red wines are structured by tannin. And when you talk about tannin, what I did is I've oversteeped this cup of uh, English breakfast tea. And this tea has been steeping for about 20 minutes. So when I taste it, I get a really, really strong, pungent, grippy, drying flavor as the tannins from the tea attack the proteins in my mouth and dry those dry those proteins right up. So I get a puckery feeling, it's a tactile experience. If you wanna know what tannin tastes like, oversteep a cup of tea and it will really give you a lovely indication of that flavor of tannin. So oversteeped cup of tea, puckering, dryness, and it's a tactile impression of dryness. And then there's acidity. So you have tannin and acidity. Red wine structured by tannin, white wine structured by acidity. So I took a fresh lemon, put a little lemon in a champagne glass, because when you think about champagne, you think about acidity. Now, I just drank pure lemon juice. I feel it very strong, almost a metallic attack on the sides of my tongue. It's hitting all parts of my tongue at the same time. And it also has a puckering effect, but it's more from acid than from tannin. So acid is verve, acid is life. Acid is slightly metallic. Tannin is more earthy and puckery, but more in a drying fashion. While uh, 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 tannin dries your mouth out, acid actually causes you to salivate. So the thing about Pinot Noirs, Pinot Noirs equally structured by both very, very fine tannin molecules and the acidity that you would get sort of in a lemon. So uh, the great thing about Pinot Noir is it's structured like a white wine, but it has a little bit of tannin. So it matches red wine dishes, but also matches white wine dishes. That's why we've all had uh, Pinot Noir with everything from uh, oysters all the way to lamb. So it can match anything at table because it's, it has both white wine and red wine structural elements. So when we taste the wine, we want to taste a balance of fruit, earth, acid, structure. The wine should seem complete. It should seem seamless. And if it's not, sometimes we need to wait for it to integrate. So time brings the wine together in a way that our mouths can't immediately. So sometimes, even though it's difficult for us as Americans, we have to be patient with the wines that we make. So that's my quick and dirty summation of uh, Pinot Noirs, three Pinot Noirs from Club Pepe Estate. They all happen to be available on the website. And we've talked a little about style ripeness, structure, and how to taste those wines and, and uh, recognize a wine. Every wine, your, your palate's the best palate. So if a wine's delicious to you, it's delicious. So uh, drink what you love, love what you drink, and we'll see you next Monday for some more questions. Thanks so much.